Hi right, guys, uh, today I'm here with Don Allen of Four Positive Paws, a certified canine behaviorist. Um, if you could just introduce yourself, Don, and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Hi, Ben. Yes, I'm Dawn from Four Positive Paws. I am a certified canine behaviorist and I specialize in working with dogs that are reactive, aggressive, or um, are very sensitive, anxious, fearful. Um, behaviors don't like labeling them as aggressive dogs it's a behavior done it now for eight years I started off as a dog walker I got qualified as a behaviorist but I found it difficult to make that start so I started off work walking um, dogs that needed to be walked on their own then I volunteered at a rescue kennels called Rescue Remedies and also the RSPCA uh, Last Chance as well I, I, I've I walked the dogs at Rescue Remedies the longest uh, because they used harnesses and they used black collars. Um, I didn't enjoy walking dogs on slip leads and especially as they were stressed and hauling themselves, I, they were choking. And um, as much as I wanted to help, although I did pick up one of my dogs from <laughs> two of those rescues, I wasn't going to get a dog. I was going to think really long and hard about it. A litter of 10 unwanted puppies came in. I had, gosh, spent a long time, probably 20 minutes, uh, looking at them and watching them pick the one that was the worst behaved, thinking I had a blank slate to start with, and got him home, and uh, he was like a piranha on legs. So, uh, yeah, he's 12 now. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I enjoy, I'm also a, a qualified trainer of people as well. So I find that really helps. I've done coaching and mentoring uh, work as well. So that really, really helps with the work that I do, being holistic in terms of dog and caregiver as well. Yeah. So yeah, that's a, a little bit about me. Yeah, happy days. So, um, I mean, we'll, we won't go into a lot of detail about it, because uh, obviously, sadly, the industry is unregulated, uh, as a lot of people do know. Um, sort of like from a pet dog owner's perspective, if they're looking for someone who they need help with their dog and they start seeing all these different labels, like um, clinical behaviorist, certified, veterinary behaviorist, just behaviorist, what, what is sort of some of the differences? Is it qualifications? Is it experience? Yeah, it's it's a bit of a minefield when somebody's trying to choose uh, to work with a dog. I mean, I can speak from my own experience when I got my first challenging dog and I was trying to find somebody to work with and I had no information at all. I didn't know what was good, bad, ugly, great. Um, lots of people made similar claims and they all charged different prices I went through several um, people that had qualifications and were with recognised bodies in the industry, but they were using outmoded methods and old punishment type methods on puppies. So for, if, for a clinical behaviourist, if you've got a serious dog behaviour issue and um, you want medication, then it's a clinical behaviourist you need to go for. There are organisations, and we can probably pop them up on your Facebook group afterwards with the, the um, leading uh, bodies that yeah. certify behaviourists. I think that would, would be helpful. Um, but for me, it's looking at whether the person has the experience that's required to work with the dog. So, for instance, I would ask, with an owner, I would say, ask how many dogs and owners has the person worked with with the behavior that you're experiencing you can always ask for a testimonial or a referral reference from a person so I've had people where I've said you can contact two or three of my previous clients to ask about how I've worked with their dogs um, have a look on people's Facebook pages as well see um, to get a flavor of how they work with dogs how they handle the dogs whether the dog looks calm and relaxed or under duress. Also, you can look at organisations like ICANN, um, Interdogs, IMDT, um, 
pet professional network. There's, um, who's the other one? Uh, yeah, Interdogs, I think I've mentioned them. Um, so there are all, there are organizations where you will not be accepted into those organizations unless there's evidence, robust evidence of how you work with dogs and that there is no harm done. So whilst there's no 100% guarantee of anybody using somebody that's not necessarily gonna cause harm, I would say if you choose to go to a, an awarding body or a lead body um, or a membership organization and find out what that organization stands for, and then they normally have a list of people that are approved and that will be a variety of the types of um, trainers and behaviorists that are available so some people call themselves behavior practitioners uh, behavior clinicians there's it, it's unregulated as you said so i think really to protect dogs and people go to these membership organizations find out what their ethos is and then get some names recommendations and then do some some research really yeah, yeah i hope that answers that question <laughs> satisfactorily ish yeah, like you say, it is a minefield. Um, I know, like the dog that started me off wanting to work with dogs, he was he was Jack, he was a staffy. Um, he came, I've spoke about him a lot on my page. Um, effectively, initially they seemed like really nice people, um, but it very quickly became apparent. Backyard breeders, quick money. Probably neither mum or dad were health tested and stuff like that, and he had a lot of issues. Um, and like when I was looking for help, you were just hit with all these different labels and price tags and like all the different initials like IMDT and IS. You were like, well, what is what? What? Who should I be looking for? Um, so yeah, that, it, that, that, that it's, sort of questions around that really. Sort of from the pet dog owner's point of view, it is a minefield trying to find the right help. I think by, I mean, I, I remember calling a, a dog trainer and asking if I could observe the class before I took my dog to the class and they went absolutely ballistic. This is about 10 years ago. Why, why would you want to do that? You know, if you want the class, you come to the class and pay for it. Obviously I didn't go with that person. Um, I think it's important to let people know that they, they can be an advocate for their dog and empower themselves to make, or make choices or change things. So for instance, when I was at a puppy class and they uh, they squirted water in the dog's, well, the dog next to me, the puppy's face, um, I, I didn't go back. But a lot of people feel obliged to stay in the course because they've paid for the whole course. And I think we can really make a difference. If that happens, we can, um, they were kennel club registered. So, you know, we can vote with our feet and we can have some recourse by contacting someone like the Kennel Club to say, look, these people are registered and these are the methods that are being used in the, the course. Um, there was a second one I went to where they threw, I had a rattle can, yes, right next to my puppy. I, I was so shocked. Um, and again, I voted with my feet, but I think it's important that if, you, if we do our homework and we talk to, we can only do our best really. So I think going to um, membership organisations, they, they have documented uh, charters and they have documented rules. And so that's a good place to start. And if someone goes to your house or out with you and they say things like, this won't hurt the dog. I mean, I do know there are, this isn't, I don't want to get down the rubbishing trainer's route, but, you know, if anyone uses a method such as discs, rattle cans, water sprays, collars, pinch collars, electric collars, um, popping the dog's collar on the lead, they are all very negative. And it's okay to say, I don't want you to do that to my dog. I want you to stop and I'd like to finish the session. And then you, you can say, I can get back to you, we'll have a discussion, but right now I just want to, I want to continue. Because those methods for sure are outmoded and unnecessary and they're abusive. And I think that because a professional person might say to a caregiver with their dog, your dog's not, it's like you're mimicking the mum, 
you know, it doesn't hurt the dog. Um, it, it, it does. And so I think as a bare minimum, those are the techniques, if you like, that you should run a mile from. Um, and it's also important to make sure, as I say, the person's experienced in the behavior. So I specialize in dogs that have bitten people and or dogs outside of or inside the home um, and have attempted to bite them. But that doesn't mean I take on every case. I take a history and I, I get to know the person on the phone first. And um, it, it's rare, but if I felt that the case was too challenging or too risky, then I would discuss that with the client and look at our options. So I think if, if that, that's a good place to start, if, if anyone calling themselves a trainer or behaviorist suggests any of those methods, don't use them and, yeah. and report, report it to whoever you can. And, and it's not being, uh, that's not malicious, that's raising standards. People like you and I um, and many behaviorists and trainers out there spend a lot of money and time on developing our skills and keeping up to date. And um, I think it's unfair that dogs, any dogs being sentient beings should be put under duress, stress, or have any pain caused to them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I would, I would vote with my feet as well. If I, I want my next dog to be a working cocker. Um, so say I went to another trainer and they start using rattle cans and stuff. I'd vote with my feet, I'd leave. Yeah. I wouldn't care if they said you're not getting your money back. <laughs> you're not treating my dog like that. Not a chance. Um, so another thing that I suppose comes into like the caregiver's mindset is when they're looking for trainer, behaviorist, um, is seeing the value in what the behaviorist brings to the table. Um, and sort of like with anything in life, whether you're looking at a new car, a house, your behaviors, whatever, it, a, a lot of the time for a lot of people, it comes down to cost um, and seeing, can we justify that expense? Can we justify that cost really? Um, but I know I'm not at your level yet. I'm well, I'm still studying, uh, but I know there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes um, when working with the dog. Um, and that's something that I don't think not intentionally or in any sort of malicious way, but I think, <clears throat> excuse me, some owners maybe don't see that as part of, well, this is why this person costs X amount of money because, you know, they're going to spend X amount of time doing a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit like an iceberg, what you see at the tip. I, I did it myself. So years ago when I started going to my first lot of workshops, I just saw what I paid I saw how many bums on seats there were, and I thought, wow, I could earn X amount of money by running a workshop. And I had no appreciation for what lay beneath the workshop. All the, um, well, the administration alone, the marketing, the advertising, and the cost and time that took, as well as, um, individual booking forms, speaking to every individual, making sure there was a correct venue that was well matched. The, <laughs> you don't just talk about something, you've got to have an underpinning knowledge about what you're talking about. You can't read something in it, well you can, you can read it in a book and repeat it, but you're not going to have any depth of, of knowledge or understanding and you can get caught out because I'll ask you a question and you don't know the answer. Now, we don't know all the answers, absolutely. We'll never know all the answers. Um, that's another thing. If anyone says to you, I know everything about dogs, <laughs> run away. Uh, it's not true. All dogs are individual. So yeah, so I saw that and I thought, God, I could make X amount of money. That would be brilliant. Um, I went on more workshops. I realized how little I knew, how much more there was to, to know. And then, as I say, when I started out, I got qualified as a behaviorist but I started with walking. And so for me, there were several things that really helped. One was I was living with dogs with the type of behaviors that needed specialist work to be able to live with them being in harmony. So I had integrated dogs that were reactive. And so I, I, I kind of 
you can never know how someone's feeling, but it absolutely gives you a measure of how you can feel if your dogs attempt to or have a fight in the house. Um, and it's not something that many people have experienced. And so when I'm dealing with clients, I have that empathy. I, I can understand. It, it's easy. I'm walking out the door after my initial consultation. They're living with their dog. So basically, yeah, I, I wanted to make sure that I had a really deep knowledge and understanding and broad. So I, as I say, volunteered at the rescue. I had my own dogs that I was living with. Um, and also, um, I continued to develop those skills and realised how much money it was costing me. Um, so I needed to make sure that, I, I, to be completely honest, you should always only do anything if you get a return on your investment in business speak. Yeah. Dog, working with dogs is a vocation. There are a few people in the world, um, for instance, Victoria Stillwell is a good example. She's had very big success, um, but I don't know how many actual dog trainers and behaviors there are in the world, but it's a small percentage that would be at that level, if you like. Um, not necessarily in skills alone, but in exposure and business and that sort of thing. So it is possible. Um, but I think a lot of people don't realise how much work and cost that there is. You don't have to. I could um, get a van, get it marked up, um, do some business cards and off I go. But for me, um, and this is where value versus cost comes in, is I wanted to make sure that people were getting value for money. But it's very difficult to quantify and qualify that when you're talking about a sentient being. So for me, it's how much is it worth a person to be able to keep their dog in their home and not relinquish the dog to rescue and to be a or, or to relinquish the dog safely, if that's the case. And how much is it worth to be able to feel safe and comfortable with your dog. Now, what it's worth and what's affordable are, are two different things. So, uh, and we all want to help everybody. So what I now do is I can offer people triage. So I don't offer any advice over the phone if I haven't seen the dog, it could be disastrous. Um, a lot of people do that and they mean really well, but if we don't see what the dog's behavior is and their body language is like, uh, for instance, one of my dogs is quite growly, but that's how she speaks. So she was relinquished, uh, re-relinquished to the rescue for growling and attempted, attempting to bite. But that was her communicating. Whereas another dog might be growling and they really mean business. And so over the phone, I wouldn't be able to do that. But there are several groups that we can direct people to that are trusted, that don't use any harmful methods. They will give appropriate advice that are registered am i allowed to say who i'm talking about yeah 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 so rd R uk reactive dogs uk is yeah. a, a big group um nick crampton set it up there's twenty five thousand members now which shows how many people are living with dogs that need support and owners that need support so yeah so what people don't see is and what i didn't see to start with is like oh gosh you charge that much money but it's how many, if you add up the hours of work. So for instance, when I have the initial inquiry, I will speak to that person um, and set up a discovery call. The discovery call might take 30 minutes to an hour, depending yeah. on the situation. Um, I had a call, for instance, I had to call Christmas Eve and it was a serious situation. And I just thought, I can't, I can't have an out of office reply to that. I can't say to them, I'll be back on the 4th of January. Um, we've had a lot of, and they haven't booked me or anything, but I just gave them some triage safety advice about gated community. Um, it's not something you can just switch off from. So basically, yeah, so I do the discovery call. Once the person's booked me, then I send out a really, 10 page detailed questionnaire to get all the history. I ask them to go for a vet referral, a vet trip to get vet referral. 
and have terms and conditions. And the reason I have terms and conditions is it's, I like transparency and to make it really clear. And this goes back to how much it costs somebody and the value. I have to make it really clear about what's realistic, about the timeline and what can be achieved, which is why I teach real life skills, because there's a toolkit you can dip into to use in the future. Excuse me. <clears throat> and so I might drive for an hour to go and see the person. So I think as, as clients, we often see, well, I've paid X amount of money for the two hours I've seen this person. Realistically, that could be eight hours plus of work because there's all the research that's done prior to me seeing them. And then the report normally takes two to four hours, excuse me, because that's their individual notes that are written up for that individual dog. Um, I'd love to have a set of handouts I've just passed out, but um, that just doesn't work. <coughs> so yes, yeah, so value is how much somebody can afford and what they see the value of what you're doing with that person. Um, there'll always be someone cheaper. I bought things that have been cheaper and the wheel falls off after three weeks. It's false yeah. economy. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, it is. Um, because, yeah, like you say, sort of from the caregiver, the, the owner's point of view, they're thinking, well, I've only seen you for two hours. I've had a phone call and then I'm not going to see you for two weeks, for, just as an example. And yeah. I'm going to have 40 minutes to an hour of your time then. And then in two weeks' time, or whatever, I'm going to have another 40 minutes to an hour or two hours. You know, so this worked out at X amount per hour. But when you actually look back, you're like, well, no, I've got 20, 30, 40, 50 hours plus already invested in your dog when I'm actually not around. You're not around. When I'm researching, I'm going over the notes, I'm liaising with vets and different things. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot that goes into working with dogs behind the scenes that sometimes gets overlooked. Oh. I think it, I think you've hit the nail on the head as well, Ben. It is an invest. We invest. And when we're doing it the way that we do it genuinely, we <clears throat> have that emotional cost as well. So it's not just writing out the paperwork. It, we think when I eat, sleep and breathe a case when I'm working with somebody, I'm thinking about how they're feeling. I'm thinking about how their dog's going to be. I'm thinking, are they going to be able to follow what I've suggested and not put themselves or their dog at risk? Um, so it's a huge emotional investment as well. And I think that it's very difficult to get that across, that it's not just sessions. For instance, it's a, pro it's a whole programme. It's a, it's a skills for life programme. So actually, it's really good value for money. And I'm very fortunate I get really good feedback from my clients. I get good testimonials. I ask them for feedback um, as a matter of course because it can help me tweak things. But everyone is so individual. Some people are people are in different places with their dogs. So some people are ready to commit to and engage with whatever it takes to support their dog to get a result. Some people are literally on their knees they have lived with this dog's behavior often for two to four years and we're the last port of call and it's explaining as well the realistic expectation if a dog's been practicing behavior for two years then it could take two years to rectify that behavior and you may never have a dog that's necessarily classed as safe or um being able to socialize with other dogs. And so I think that's really important to discuss that up front with people as well. And I say to people, you know, where are we at now? Because um, it is difficult, you know, sometimes dogs are at the last point and they may be at risk of being put to sleep, relinquished. There could be children in the house. These things don't come lightly on the emotional side of things when we're working with people. So it's I think on the outside, you think, oh, it's really nice to work with dogs. But again, that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's much bigger than that. Um, and I think as well, you know, a client doesn't want to hear that you spent four hours writing up their report. Who cares? <laughs> but I yeah. do make the point of saying to people, 
I do take a lot of time writing these reports. Please do read them. I've I've been of late. I've been putting in questions in the report, so I can check if they've been read. And it's not to catch people out, but if I, you know, honest, if I go and see someone on a Saturday afternoon, if I spend virtually my whole Sunday writing up a report, I do see it as a way as well of developing my own knowledge and skills. So I will look at the latest video clips, the science-based papers. So everyone's getting something fresh when I send those notes out. But I'm winning as well and benefiting because I think, oh, I can use that clip next time. Or oh, I didn't know that I can research that book. So it, it, it's not the fact that I'm a martyr and I spend my Sundays doing reports. But, you know, it, it's true. It's not just, I mean, some of the reports I do are eight pages long and I keep them very concise. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think it's important. And, and I do... I. I have worked with a lot of dogs and owners that have worked with other people before. And I'm sure that's the same to be said for me as well. Um, and that's not a criticism, but I asked for a copy of the report that was done or, and these are serious cases and there's nothing documented at all. It's either being telephone conversations and a few emails. And it does smart a bit because you think, well, you know, I've spent all that time doing that report and I could just walk in, tell them, right, these are three things I'd like you to do till we meet next time and, and hot foot it out of there and have a nice Sunday. I, ju I just can't work like that. I think it's, for me, I don't feel that is a responsible way when, when you're working with a dog that's got a bite history. So, yeah, I think it's a question of raising the bar. Um, if someone phones me with an expectation and thinks, well, I don't have any idea how much a, a trainer costs. I've seen it advertised for 45 quid. That's sort of how much you charge. And I'll say no. I give them my prices. I'm very transparent about it. But if I can't help them and they need help, I can at least signpost them to someone like RD UK where they are going to get some support in, in a different format. And they might come back to me and they'll probably tell somebody else that I helped them out because I sent them in the right direction rather than leaving them at the mercy of Facebook and social media, trying to find a, a, a trainer or behaviourist that's going to be modern and up to date. So, Yeah, yeah. So I was touching on from that. I know it says on your website you're very client and canine focused based on real life um, and positive change, um, which I think is quite amazing, really. Cause sort of like you think of dog training and stuff it, it tends to go on at village halls um industrial units and stuff like farmers fields and stuff that get rented out um and you know these puppies and adolescents dogs go there and they can sit they can get sent to a bed they can lose lead walk and all that um but then when the owners go out into the real world suddenly a lot of these skills that their dog was smashing out the park <laughs> not there um yeah. Because it doesn't get carried over into real world situations and scenarios. And, uh, so like I've took on dogs like for walking and stuff. And it's like the dog's amazing at, at the training class. But then you take the dog out and it's like, are you sure this dog knows how to loosely <laughs> walk? Because it's just pulling everywhere and it's doing so you think. I think there is, there seems, because I follow quite a lot of different dog trainers and behaviours and stuff on social media. And there does seem to be this big shift towards not achieving tricks and behaviours and stuff within puppy class and adolescent class and real life, setting people up for success within real life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I really liked about how that was wrote on your website, real life. Thank you. Yeah, because real life is unpredictable, as we have all seen since lockdown and COVID. It's become extremely unpredictable with rapid change and we've seen human behavior change yeah. over the last year um, or just under so um yeah i i i teach people um with with their dogs in public spaces it does depend on the dog so i have got spaces where i can hire um, a paddock and the dogs are always on lead but it would normally be if the dog was particularly nervous or um, just couldn't cope, can't really cope with anything, then that's a safe space to start. Or COVID allowing uh, maybe their garden, 
but they are in a different environment um, which can create different behaviours, as you've just said. So I look at, um, I mean, often we, we sort of set off for a walk and, and the owner's about 100 miles up the road. I don't walk past anyway, but I'm like, hello. <laughs> um, it's just, slow, you know, slow things down. What, what does this dog in front of us need? And I think we can, as professionals, feel pressured to produce results quickly. And we can feel that pressure that we must perform ourselves to get the dog to be perform a behaviour. But very often the environment just is never going to allow that to happen. So we kind of want to hide into nothing. So for me, using real life spaces that are well matched to the individual dog. So for instance, there are um, some on lead only spaces or it can be a really popular place where all the dogs and owners turn up in the car park and they go off down the main part and none of them are going to be in the bit we're in because our bit's boring and it's small um, but it's perfect and yeah. so if we do see another dog so it, and, and again it's very dynamic and that's real life so um I love using analogies. So for instance, I, I use the analogy a lot of driving a, a car. So when I learned to drive a car, I didn't know anything. So my instructor said to me, like, tell me what you know. And I said, it's got four wheels, a door and a steering wheel. And he must have thought, oh, God, got my work cut out with this one. And I was really anxious. I was anxious of being in a confined space. I was anxious of the car and I was anxious with the tutor. Um, which all didn't make for a very relaxed lesson. But it was okay, you know, talk, talk to me. He said, we're not going to move. Nothing's going to happen. You, you, this, we just talk you through. This is a gear stick, steering, you know. That. Okay, that's fine. And then we start the engine, which was scary, because now the car, is it going to move? I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. He's going, no, you need to relax. It's not going to move till you take the handbrake off. And I, I equate that in a parallel to our dogs. In the hall... When we've got four walls or in a, a field where we've got a secure field um, and just our dogs we've got control over the situation more or less when we're out in public we don't have that control and there are so many things stacked so for me it's about working with how does the owner feel taking this dog out first of all because sometimes they're a bag of nerves understandably yeah. Um, yeah. and so using real life space kind of helps people like yeah I get that that's a wood there's a bit of a tree there there's a bench there we take things slowly um but i find that and then let's say a squirrel appears so i'll give you an example actually i was out with a client a couple well about a month ago um and we'd got to the stage where i was able to bring one of my own dogs along and we were doing some parallel walking um but I did make it really clear at the start that if something happens, we each have to take responsibility for our own dogs. Because whilst I can coach this person and their dog, I've got my dog. And if something happens, we need to take that responsibility. This person then had the skills and the tools to be able to do that. And they were consenting and that was fine. Enjoying a, a walk and these two massive deer, I mean, they were the size of llamas came flying out across towards the main road in a place you would never normally see a deer. But, and they were also really camouflaged. So what I said was, I looked up and went, okay, just breathe, too big deer, hold on, because I thought that the dogs were gonna, I mean, quite rightly, they were, and they were only about 25 feet away from us. And the owner was, what deer? <laughs> and my dog just was she, I was surprised she just did still and wind a bit um, I said that's because I'm such an amazing behaviourist <laughs> no. um, and her dog was very hyper so I just focused on the owner and said let's talk this through and I thought the best thing to do was just go towards the trail of the scent and help the dog get the nose down but it was obvious after getting to the trail walking away from where the deer had been that the dog was escalating. So we scooped around and we, we headed away. And within five, 10 minutes, the dog was calm again. But with a different dog, we might have been able to follow that trail. And then yeah. the dog got the nose down. So 
it, it, it's a lot of it's very demanding because you're in a live situation you're thinking on your feet you're looking at the dog um but i feel that it helps give somebody confidence they lived to tell the tale you know they so they could see what their dog did they coped well with it the human coped well with it success and i think we all need to have that sense of success and achievement so um i trained with sheila harper and she did a brilliant seminar um, last week or the week before and it was just a remi huge reminder about what our dogs need you know they need to have a sense of achievement they need to know they've problem solved something they do have self-esteem and they can have the, i know it sounds like it's humanizing but it's so important to teach people that our dogs need those things as much as we do um, and they need a bit of predictability it's like me taking somebody, like I have done, to a new location. They're thinking, I don't know what's here. I do, do I trust Dawn? You know, is she going to keep you safe? And that's what our dogs are saying. Am I safe here? So, yeah, I like to teach real life skills, dog centered. What does this individual dog need? Does the dog need um, a faster pace, a slower pace, more scent, less scent, um, a calmer input from the owner? is generally a given and pretty quickly you see a result but I don't publish that if that makes sense because I want the owners to see because I don't know some dogs are so embedded with their behaviors it takes a while longer but you can often quite quickly see a result with some little tweaks and these are skills for life they're not things that owners got to remember when I see a dog I've got to do x or y it's more predictive walking, you know, where you're walking, have you chosen the right place in the first place? And if you have, what might be different? So often we get out the car, we're off on our walk. And I say to people, hang on a second, there's a dog getting out from the car next to yours. So use, it's like predictive text, predictive walk, you know, make sure you look ahead. So that's more generalist rather than specific. So that's how I teach people. Yeah, but I, I have noticed, obviously, because due to COVID, a lot of people are working as much as they were uh, last year and sort of looking at people who were like writing new puppy classes and adolescents and adult dogs and different types of workshops and stuff. And there is seems to be a really big shift towards life skills and real life stuff rather than just in a village hall teaching sit or down or yeah. and i think it's i think it's great i mean it's it's certainly got people thinking about how they deliver things as well um it's convenient to go to a hall and have x amount of people in one space it is a bit like herding cats if you've got a group i ran a group um puppy socialization course but we only had three puppies um out, and it was absolutely awesome to see those three puppies at the slightly different divet developmental stages they were at, the different sizes and breed traits they had, and how they developed those skills. So the overconfident one became a bit more balanced and polite. The nervous one became much more sort of proud and confident and less shy. Um, and then the other one was able to sort of calm down and think a little bit more. That for me is priceless. That is why I do what I do. Those puppies have a good chance of developing and continuing with those basic skills and the owner's input as well. I think that it is possible to teach on Zoom as well. So um, I did have a case where I had to use Zoom. Um, I think it has to have a lot of thought when it, it's done and it depends on the type of behaviour that you're dealing with as well. But I think, yeah, being outdoors, it's difficult as well, isn't it? If it's we were so lucky for most of the time, we hardly ever had bad weather. Oh. I mean, it was just amazing, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, but yeah, it's and and also I've said to people, I don't need to be with your dog. You know, if we have to have a session where the rules allowed, where we would go off and have a coffee without the dog and talk through, without that distraction, without that pressure. Um, allows the customer to share that information more freely 
and then take away those things to work on, not for the first session, but normally a second session. If it was pouring with rain, you know, we'd find somewhere. I ended up in someone's shed on one occasion where they, they, had, they had an umbrella outside and I was inside the shed. <laughs> it's, we were very creative. Yeah, because um, I think we, we touched on it. I think when I talk with Jack, because I like his approach, how he's not dead quick to fuss the dogs and interact with them and stuff. Because um, as humans, that sort of it's sort of embedded in us in a way, isn't it? Like you see a cute puppy or whatever, and you want to go and fuss. Um, and I've completely lost my train of thought now. What you said about uh, oh yeah, like the dog not being there. Yes, yeah. It, it's it, it's amazing how you would never. I'd never have thought about it before, but I just know that it's like if I want to learn how to drive a car, that some of it I was coached while I was driving. But and that's why I think the notes are so important as well, because with the best will in the world, you're out walking and you're giving some input. I use video footage as well, which is so helpful because. Yeah. You pick up so many little nuances of body language, could be a little lip lick, a little bit of a closed muzzle. And for me, teaching people about body language is really fundamental because so frequently we could avoid bites just by keeping a safer space and respecting the dog's space, our proximity, and just putting out, you know, where do we put our face? I, I take my dog sometimes to vets and I just think, but please don't put your face there. My dog hasn't got a bite history, but you don't know my dog. <laughs> and I'd never put my face there with an unfamiliar dog. I don't even, you've never met this dog before. And again, that's not a criticism. I just, I just think it's a lack of, I, I guess we, it's never happened. Therefore it probably won't until it does. But I think teaching people, um, especially with children, it's it's definitely more challenging because then a, a, a caregiver's got to parent the dog and parent the children and have some level of self-care for themselves. So I always include self-care with the work I do. If you haven't got that mask, mask on yourself, that oxygen mask, you have got no resources left. So if I go to see somebody that is depleted, then I would use a diff different tactic and a different approach to somebody who was much more kind of, you know, ready, ready to go because, because people are so individual. One thing I was going to say about the life skills, it has become a bit of a trend. So people are still doing training to sit and down and calling it life skills. Um, and that, again, that's not a criticism, but for me, real life skills is can my dog um, make good choices? Is my dog a little bit interdependent of themselves? And do they feel they have the ability to influence from their end of the lead as well as my end of the lead? And for me, that's what the real life skills are with some support and facilitation from the owner rather than the command-based type of... And again, I say, nothing, I'm not criticising command-based, but it's just very different how I actually work with dogs in real life yeah. yeah 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 i've noticed that there is about like the dog not being there in certain sessions and stuff it's it's just something i think i've subconsciously sort of picked up on from different people mm. but they've said um i think when i was on dog to human aggression with dave bryce and he gave us an example of a dog he'd worked with like a earlier on this year or something mm. it's like he's never actually even met the dog yeah he's never met it's all been done over zoom email phone call uh being sent videos via whatsapp and stuff from the client and somebody like you know because it wasn't in the interest of the dog to actually meet the dog absolutely i the case i worked with there was it was an interdog issue my presence there would have added another layer of a trigger or stress to the dog and the owner um and it was it just enabled us to do something without stressing the dog out or the owner and it was really really useful i we use video footage um and we coached i coached as well but 
in some situations and, and again that's difficult for people I think as an owner I might think what do you mean you're gonna work with me but you've got to sort my dog out <laughs> and it's not about that at all and that's why the discovery call is really important and um, contracting and understanding what I'm going to do and my expectations as well as the caregiver because if someone says look you know I've been trying to get my dog sorted trade no one else can help me I've been through 10 trainers um, and you're the last port of call um, I would have a discussion about whether we were an appropriate match or not because it's my reputation as well and it's not fair on the dog or owner so we need to have a clear understanding to start with about how I'll work and if a dog has I mean the first the dog where I was in the shed <laughs> um, our first session I, I didn't meet I didn't meet the dog at all because the dog would, was wetting themselves with fear and, and, and what owner wants that happening in the house and the dog doesn't need to experience that and I could go and say oh it's okay that I'm fine dogs are fine with me but I just wouldn't want to put a dog in that position and it's a new dog in a new home so they need to really feel safe they don't need a stranger like me coming in um, no matter how good my body language is and, and non-offensive it is so that was really useful in that case as well. So yeah, it's just different. Again, it's looking at the dog in front of us and, and what the, the scenario is. You could have three of the same breed, three of the same age, three of the same gender, three different environments, and they'll all be, my own three dogs all need different walks. You know, I'd love, I'd love to take them all out together on the lead, but I just wouldn't, not because of them, but if we came across an unskilled, out of control, off lead dog, it, it wouldn't be appropriate for anybody. So, yeah, they've all got individual needs that are catered for. Yeah. Yeah, because that's how I work. Um, cause I do a lot of one to one dog walking. Mm -hmm. um, I don't walk mixed groups or mixed households. It's one or multiple dogs from the same house. Um, and I tailor make each walk to the dog. That's brilliant. Because like Toby, the working cocker spaniel, scent work and stuff like that, he just, he's in his element, loves it. Um, and then say like Kia, the Jack Russell lurcher, who's really nervous, she likes to just sort of amble and just have a sniff. Yeah. Whereas Toby, typical spaniel, it's 300 miles an hour. And shum, you know, he's the most confident dog in the world. There's no behavioural or training issues there, so he can be off lead. Um, and he does his thing. And then you've got to say like Waffle, the Romy street dog who I work with, he's really nervous of men. So yeah. we're working on stuff like that, um, but we predominantly sort of stick to really quiet areas. I, um, I hope you're charging a premium, Ben, for your services, because that's a lovely example of value over cost. Um, I... I think with dog walking, it is a, an art and a skill. And I think that when it's dog centered, what, what price would you pay for your dog to be safe and have a safe, calm, relaxed, pleasurable walk with really good quality, as opposed to a dog in a van with 20 other dogs? You know, I, I, I think it's how we get that message across to owners that, it's like I think I guess I think the thing that's come to mind is when we don't pay for cash for something with cash so we don't see it so it's all plastic flash plastic 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 and then you get your bill in we don't actually see it so with the dog walking perhaps um I mean when I had to find a dog walker for my dog that was very very shut down very very nervous and it was at a time when there was a lot more um publicity about dangerous dogs and breed specific legislation so I tried really hard first of all to find someone who was available secondly who would walk her one-to-one -one. and the, the lady that came to the house um, looked at my dog and said oh that, she looks like one of those fighting dogs that was the first thing she said she was a Labrador cross bull mastiff I think um, she looked like a rotty actually had a lot of rotty in her actually as well 
but it scared me of my dog. It made me scared of my dog. Um, I had a broken foot. That's how I had to get the dog walker in because I just rescued her. I couldn't walk her. And, um, but I said I had to go with the lady for the first walk. She parked yeah. up on the main road. She had an estate car, no tailgate. There was another dog in there. And she was saying, you better stay in there or else. And I just said to her, oh, it's, you're not going to be suitable for me. Um, and we, what we don't see doesn't hurt us. And I think that what you do is really important and how it should be with dog walking. It's not just taking the dog for a walk, but there are so many. And it's how we differentiate ourselves and our services so that our clients have that peace of mind about the value they're getting for their dog. Yeah. Yeah, like um, recently with Waffle, started taking him up. It's like a local beauty spot. It's called Werner's Low. Uh, it stretches for miles, and there's bits of woodland and open fields. There's a golf course and stuff attached to it. But stick him to the quieter parts, because he, he is it's a very typical Rummy dog. He likes to just stand and observe and watch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I've done quite a bit of. CPD through Mish Masters, who's she's a Rummy Dog specialist. Uh, about the last ten years, I think it is. I said like that. That is very common with them. They do like to stand, watch, observe. Is it safe? Is it not safe? Mm. Uh, but we stick to quiet areas so we can do what comes naturally to him. Um, but then recently started introducing Steve Mann's rucksack walk with him, uh, with like novel scents, novel food, chewed toys, and stuff like that. And the first time we did it, it, oh, it didn't even last 15 minutes. Unfortunately, so Steve will kill me for saying that because I always <laughs> say at least 15 minutes. It only lasted about six, seven minutes because he just plowed through the food and stuff. But it wasn't about the time that he took. It was about that connection with him. Absolutely. Because even Absolutely. though he's really, really comfortable with me now, it wasn't when I first met him because he's quite scared of men. Um even though he is comfortable, he never really sort of seeks out human touch or affection. Yeah. Whereas on that, he was amazing. He, he chose to sit on me and he'd knock me over and all sorts. He sat on my head and watched planes go in and he was mm -hmm. initiating fuss and contact and stroke. And I'd planned to do it already. So I put my tripod in it and I filmed it because I know that that's part of the rule of the rucksack walk, that there's no phones. So yeah. There's no it to be on your phone, you're not checking social media and stuff. And I just had it set up and it just filmed us doing it as we did. Wow. Uh, and it was amazing. It wasn't about the time that it took or whether he was interested in the scent or anything. It was just mm. getting that bond and that connection with him. Absolutely. And what's that? What price you've got on that to have that connection and that trust is is priceless. It's like I say, it's not about taking the dog for an hour's walk. And I was able to, when I did it, talk to clients about that value. And they loved that if it was really hot, I, I would either not take the dog out or I'd take them to a certain place. And it wouldn't be for X amount of time. They were paying for the activity, if you like, and that connection. Because can you imagine? I mean, the trust dogs have to have in us as well. We go to the house, you take them out on a lead. The owner's not there. Um, get Maybe in a vehicle, take them somewhere they don't know. I, I think we really underestimate a lot of the time how much our dogs do have to cope with on a day-to-day -day basis and that's part of how I work with people not making them feel bad but even with myself I've been through it I used to rush around and huff and puff one of my dogs at the moment if I get cross even with myself she'll come up and start whining she doesn't feel safe so I have to pretend like I was in the middle of some deep thoughts and then change my focus and do something else. And then she's like, okay, yeah, it's, it's safe now. So yeah, dogs, dogs deserve um, to be treated and worked with and walked by people that, that invest time and money in, in, in their care, but also they have that empathy with the dogs as well. It's not about the piece of paper on the certificate on the wall. It's that as well as having integrity for sure. Yeah, because yeah, um, I, I get a bit twitchy when it comes to weather, whether it's hot or cold, um, whether dogs should be out and stuff. Well, because I'm being entrusted with someone else's dog. 
Um, and to me, it doesn't matter whether they got it free off a website that we won't name uh, <laughs> or whether they paid a lot of money from a breeder. That dog is priceless to that family. Yeah. Uh, you know, and different weather conditions, heat stroke, burnt paws, hypothermia, different things uh, can kick in. So I always say to like owners, like, you know, it's really warm, whatever. I'm not walking. I'll do a, obviously around COVID, uh, in-home visit. We'll yeah. do a bit of time in the back garden that's monitored so that they're not out in direct sunlight for a long time and stuff like that. Or if it's really, really cold and stuff. I mean, I've got some dogs that they're quite sensitive to the weather. Yeah. Some dogs, no. It can just be drizzling just a little bit. <laughs> You could have the most tasty sausages, hot dogs, whatever. They're not, <laughs> leaving, they're not leaving the house. So. Yeah. Now, quite, I'm quite lucky, really, that a lot of my owners are just like, I've just seen out the office window, it's absolutely chucking down, so I know he's not going to go out today, so just make yourself a brew and play games and stuff. Yeah. Because um, that, that's a, a big thing, it is trusting someone with your dog like that, that they're not going to put them in a situation where they could actually become quite ill through, just through the weather conditions. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, again, it's, it, like you say, it's trust and it's making sure that if someone trusts you, you're not going to pull a fast one. You're doing it because of the well-being and welfare of the dog. And often it's so much more than that. I mean, I used to clear up after dogs when they'd had an accident. Um, I'd end up feeding the cat and injecting the cat and doing all, all sorts of things because the person valued what I had to offer as a, as a human being looking after and, and as a caregiver to their dog. So I just think it's, it's just so important for people to, I think it's two ways. I think, I think it's educating caregivers about what is safe and good. Um, there's all this, I think with social media as well, you find this kind of popularity contest type thing. If someone posts like I need a, dog trainer for my dog or a behaviorist and you get this oh this person's the best and then someone says, oh this person's the best and then it gets into this competitive oh well, we'd never use um, anyone except this person and I'm very fortunate I'm in a, a fairly big dog group and you see people sort of rushing in saying oh pick me pick me and I'm just thinking I get referred if someone wants to put my name up there that's absolutely fine and, and if they don't, that, that's fine because I want people to come to me. Um, it sounds a bit daft, I suppose. Business, it doesn't make sense sometimes on the business side of things. You think, oh, I, 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 most of my business comes from word of mouth and referral um, yeah. and through clients, vets, um, other practitioners as well. And, um, yeah, I think that speaks speaks volumes but it, you get that with Facebook and that's where people think oh if, if Mrs Smith uses so and so then I'll use so and so and that's brilliant as long as there's no harmful methods being used and it's appropriate I think standards are rising a lot in the industry um, but it, I just get dismayed when I see people that have resorted back to a prong collar um, because the, the trainers said well we've tried everything else the only thing that's going to be able to work is a prong collar, but you can get something that fits around it so no one will see it. And I just think, well, you know, mm -mm, that's that's not okay. If, if you're, it, it's okay not to have a result. So I'm, I can say, what's the best we can do with this dog? What's the best we can expect of this dog? And my dogs have improved and it's taken years for some of them. I've got to the best place I think I'm at and then they'll do something and I just think, wow you're amazing you know you've coped with that and i I've, I've taught you how to cope with it i haven't taught you what to do you've learned how to cope with it yourself and that and that's that, that blows my mind as well yeah and yeah yeah i know um because a lot of the dogs that i walk do fall under the reactive so they're like fearful nervous anxious whatever um so I'm very picky on where we walk and different things like that, depending on each individual dog and what their individual triggers are. Um, but if you just know very quickly that this walk's not going to go well, even though yeah, you're not yeah. or whatever, yeah. you, have, you have an inkling just on their body language and stuff. Um, 
and I'll message you on like we're on our way back. Uh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Out five minutes or ten minutes, or we've only been out fifty minutes of the hour. Whatever, but that remaining time, I'll just do in the house. And I've spent time curled up under dining tables, sat off with the on the stairs, on the floor, different places. Wherever that dog has chose to feel. Oh, hang on yeah. one second. My dog needs to go out for a week. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll have to pop off again in a minute. Uh, but <laughs> wherever that dog feels safe, because um, like Dita, who I walk, she's quite sensitive to various things. Um, and yeah, I've, I've spent a lot of time with her in the house where she wants to just be at the top of the stairs away from everything because there's no windows near there. She's just surrounded by the bedroom doors and she likes to just sit there and just chill out. How amazing must our dogs feel when you feel listened to. I, I mean, again, I use the analogy of humans when we're with somebody that suppresses, you know, we can't, we can't express how we feel. We have to suppress how we feel. And that could be a relationship, for instance, if you're with a friend and you, you can feel, you, you can say what you like, you, you go into a situation where you've got a boss and you can't, you don't change how you feel, but you can't express that directly and change that behavior. And I think so many dogs don't get listened to. And that's, it's not done intentional with malice. There's just no, it, there's no compass for that. Or, or on, it's not on the radar. And I think it's amazing where, I mean, I, I've done that with behavior. If we've gone to a location and I've said, well, it's not suitable. You know, when we had lockdown, my quiet places that were really, really safe were completely rammed with vehicles people coming from out of area to small places and I couldn't I wouldn't even take my own dogs there for the first lockdown because they weren't appropriate anymore thankfully it's changed back again I thought I'd lost them but yeah I think um just just touching base as well going back to how to choose um I mean I'm a, I am a member of Interdogs I'm just starting my ISCP level six behavior course um yeah i've done level four um but i'm i just embarked on my level six so um again will i get a return on my investment yeah eventually <laughs> um but i love learning and i love teaching and i love coaching and i love mentoring and i think that if we can save one dog from being relinquished or um from harming or being harmed then that really is what it's all about. That's my passion. That's why I do what I do. Um, and I've seen the huge benefits of my own dogs as well. Um, and dogs where people have lost trust in their dogs and they've started to trust their dog again. And it's just, it's just absolutely awesome. Absolutely brilliant. That's amazing when that happens. It's that is lovely. It's just... And it's, some, it's the tiniest thing sometimes. So, you know, you've got someone thinking, oh, I'll never be able to do this, I'll never be able to do that. And then you, you go for that little walk and they don't pull on the lead or they just, they're soft about something. And you just think, wow, that's just, yeah, that's, that pulls at the heartstrings. Yeah, that's amazing when, like you say, it, it doesn't even have to be like the really big ticket items, really. It can just be little things that owners notice and it's just like, to them, that's worth everything. That's, yeah. yeah. They would literally give everything they own just for that moment yeah. that you've helped create in some way through your influence and knowledge, and training and stuff. It's, um, it's amazing when it does happen. If you hear a funny noise, one of my dogs is snoring really loudly. Yeah, I'm just watching because we've got snow here at the minute. Have you? Although it's, mel it's melting now. Here she comes. <laughs> so, yeah, every time she comes in from the back door, she's been in the back garden. 
she'll just sort of walk in with her nose in the air and just how can they tippy tappy paws on the floor <laughs> but yeah we're forecast to have a big snowstorm i think in the next week or so i'm in west sussex so um, we don't get snow often but that's just what we need get snowed in <laughs> yeah yeah that's amazing um i think going off all the notes that i've made i think we've covered everything really yeah it's been a good discussion we've covered a lot of different things which is brilliant and it's been amazing talking to you um as i say i just think that we can raise the bar raise awareness and um all for the dogs benefit and owners as well it's heartbreaking if you have to relinquish a dog and it's blooming tough living with a dog that's reactive that you never imagine you don't even know what a reactive dog is you take your dog out for a walk they react to another dog with a growl and lunge that's scary then you get scared then you think what have i done and it can feel really really horrible and i just know that there is help out there for everybody um and for everybody's budget you know it's there's if you go to the right places and you get the right help then there's you don't have to suffer in silence shout yeah. out ask for help yeah definitely yeah that's, that's something i learned the hard way um which i dis i discussed with greg uh, when i spoke to greg earlier on today <clears throat> the dog who set me on the path to wanting to work with dogs jack um i hid his issues from the world yeah um because even though when I've had a shave and that I look about 12, I'm actually like mid <laughs> I'm actually mid 30s. Um, <laughs> and he was a blue staff. Um, Gorgeous. He had a, oh, he was stunning to look at visually. Um, but genetically and mentally, he was quite messed up from day one. Um, and I didn't want to be that stereotype yeah. of the young guy with the shaved right. head yeah status yeah. dog yeah and he's got a status dog um i mean i mean i purposely went out my way and i had a leather harness made for him with a batman logo on <laughs> um with the minimal amount of metal work involved all the, the metal work was just to keep the harness together i didn't want no oh, spikes no stud work nothing like that i wanted just to try and soften his look because he was muscle bound um but he did have quite a lot of issues. Um, we had him under the team at Dogs Trust and stuff through their behaviour. Okay. Um, and at the time, you think you're doing the right thing by sort of not reaching out for help. It's like, well, all they're going to see is another young lad with a bull breed. It's um, like when we first brought him home and I asked, I inquired about different puppy classes and stuff. And I had one of the things that you said about a dog walker said, why do you want to bring him here? He's, he's a fighting dog. And I was like, well, if, if I'd bought him for that purpose, which I haven't. <laughs> you wouldn't be in the class. Why would I want him to come to puppy classes? Yeah. But the, the, the two worlds don't meet. I mean, well, I, I like you. I'm very passionate about my bull breeds. I think we have to be extra... Um, special with them in terms of the image that they've got and the risks and the prejudice as well and um, I'm very conscious of my own dogs and where I walk them. Dog theft at the moment is absolutely rife. I don't know what it's like where you are but around where we are every day another dog's getting stolen either physically being taken off owners while they're walking or from gardens and I think um, it's really important that people, we kind of break down the stigma. I guess it's a bit like, I don't want to make light of mental health because I'm very passionate about it. But I think with mental health, we're talking about it more. And I think we need to, you know, not be embarrassed if our dog is behaving in a certain way. I mean, it's really, one of mine's really vocal. She's still reactive. She's always going to be a reactive girl to certain things. She's 100% better than she was. But people see me walking her and I think, oh, my gosh, and I think you, would, you, you need to have seen her when I got her. You know, you're seeing the dog now. You're not seeing this dog. And people say, oh, it's disgusting. And, oh, that dog's vicious. And I just think, well, do we speak about humans like that? Yes, we do at the moment, you know, especially on Facebook, <clears throat> things like that. And I just think we need to be kind. 
but if yeah, people are struggling. I think people don't ask because they don't know what what they can do. I don't know. I don't think they know that they can get help or how much it will cost is a, is a fear, which is why I like the discovery call. There's no, I had somebody, it was brilliant. I got an email and they, they basically said, tell me how much you are because there's no point in having a discussion if I can't afford you, which is true. Yeah. Um, they had been given a quote by somebody that was ex on the higher end. And so I said, I can, I'm not hiding my prices. I can give you the prices. But I won't give you a sledgehammer to crack a nut. If we have the discussion and I feel that there's two or three things you could do to make things better or that you could go to a Facebook group um, or join a membership group and get that support, then I will signpost you there. I will, if, if it's not doesn't warrant a behaviour programme, so I kind of had that trust to start with um, and they went, they did go ahead and they booked a programme and they became fabulous advocates of, of the work I do. Um, but I could have got funny about it and said, well, I'm not telling you the price or we've got to have a call first. I said, no, th these are the prices, but let's have the call, you know, um, because again, as I say, integrity is so important. I, I'm not having, I'm not very egotistical. I don't need to show off. Um, and I just like to relate to the person and the dog in front of me and work out with them how we can get the best out of their dog um, and best quality of life for them to, to live in the best harmony. All sounds a bit Mary Poppins, but that's that's how it is. Yeah, that's the aim, isn't it? For the dog to have the best possible quality of life um, and live in harmony with their owners and where their owners are stressed and... Yeah. Stuff like that. Um, I don't know, like, I, I do get messages from owners and stuff. And it, it's often late at night and it's like, you know, we've been out on a walk today and this has happened or that's happened or we narrowly avoided this. And it's nice that they trust me with that. Yeah. So yeah. They, they can offload and say, look, this has happened. Uh, and sort of not getting them to forget it or ignore it, but it's like turning it on its head and, you know, tomorrow's a new day, you go again. Yeah. We know whether the name of the dog is, is reactive to or X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, but the dog isn't reactive 24-7. It's, yeah. not, it's not constantly spewing out reactive behaviours. Have a few rest days, do some scenty stuff in the house, some enrichment, maybe have a day or two where the dog doesn't do anything. Just let the dog chill. <laughs> It gives the clients permission as well to stand down. It gives them permission to say, you've not got to put yourself through that another day. I love the saying, um, we can't change the past, but we can create the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sort of, so I've, I've introduced it with a few sort of clients about like rest days. Where, you know, if the dog doesn't go out on a big walk or anything, it stays in the house in the garden, uh, mm. do scent stuff. Or if it's had... A really big event or reaction maybe the, the first day or two after there's, there's no expectation on the dog to do anything if he wants to just yeah. sit on the sofa or in its bed and chill and just let all those stress hormones deplete let mm -hmm. it do that yeah just let it do that there's, there's no need to be out walking your dog every day when it's it's just going to trigger stack and the reactions are going to get bigger and the fuse of that dog is going to get shorter. Yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the owners as well. That's that fuse is that anticipation is there. And it's just, yeah, just take a step back and give yourself permission to have a do day day. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes that's just what it calls for. So, yeah. Anyway, it's been, um, been amazing talking to you. It's been great. Yeah, it's been good talking to you too. Yep. Um, so for anyone uh, watching where can they find you on social media if they so wished um, on social media I'm for positive pause that's f-o-u-r p-o-s-i-t-i-v-e pause p-a-w-s and yep. my website is www.forpositivepause.co.uk either way I can be reached there and um, yeah just love to, to hear from anybody that is local to me or that I can refer on. So it's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Thanks for being Thank on. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. Bye.